Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 14th, 2014, and my guest is Nick Bostrom, professor of philosophy at the University of Oxford. His latest book, which is the topic of today's episode, is Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies. Nick, welcome to Econ Talk. Uh, thanks for having me. So we're going to be talking about smart machines, artificial intelligence. Uh, those are topics we've talked about before in Econ Talk. But your book is about really smart machines, uh, what you call or smart entities, and you call that super intelligence. So what is super intelligence? Uh, well, I define it as any intellect that radically outperforms humanity in all practically relevant fields. So it would include things like scientific creativity, social skills, general wisdom. But you can see it in the books at some point that intelligence, what we use that word to mean, is not always a good guide to out social outcomes, uh, policy decisions, et cetera, right? Well, no, certainly I think, uh, and, and this is one of the claims I elaborate in the book, non-necessary connection between being very intelligent and being very good or having a beneficial out uh, impact. So uh, when you talk about superintelligence, what, what are, you, are you ruling anything out? Well, I'm ruling out all kinds of intelligences that are less than um, radically superior to humanity in all practically relevant fields. So all other non-human animal intelligences, all current human level intelligences. Um, I think, though, that there is a level of um, general intelligence that becomes effectively universal. Um, once you have a sufficient level of general intelligence, you should be able to design new cognitive modules to do whatever forms of intelligent information processing that you might not initially have been capable of doing. So if you were an engineering superintelligence and you lacked the ability to understand poetry, you should be able to use your engineering superintelligence to construct uh, additional mental modules to also be able to understand poetry. So I think there is a kind of universality once you reach a sufficiently high level of intelligence. Yes, I'm pressing you on this because I think it's it's somewhat important. It, it may not be uh, ultimately important, but I think it's somewhat important in that you, at a couple of times in the book, you encourage the reader to use uh, his or her imagination to, to realize the fact that there's not – we think of an Einstein being dramatically smarter than a, um, a person of, say, below average uh, IQ, but that you're imagining somebody that would dwarf an Einstein by many – not a someone. You're imagining an entity that would dwarf an Einstein by many, many magnitudes, and I'm trying to get a feel for what that would mean. So one of the things it might mean, of course, is that you would – process you can make calculations more quickly those are these are ways that we understand the way that computers have outpaced humans today a computer can find the author of a poem say more quickly than i can trying to remember it it might take me a while i might not even be able to remember it at all it could be in my memory i may have heard of it at one time but try to flesh out what you mean then by intelligence if you mean something more than say speed of computing power? I think we can distinguish three different um, flavors of superintelligence. Now, they might all be combined into one, but speed superintelligence is one dimension, the easiest one uh, conceptually. Take a human-like mind and just imagine that it operated, uh, say, a million times faster, then you would have some kind of superintelligence type of thing in that this this human mind could achieve things um, that 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 the human could not do within a given interval of time. So that's like one obvious dimension, just speed it up. Right. A another dimension is a collective superintelligence where you just have more minds. 
And so, so we know that like a thousand people might be able together to solve a problem within a given amount of time that would be beyond any one of them. They could maybe divide the problem up into pieces and make faster progress. So a speed superintelligence, maybe uh, if you imagine it having human-like mind as components, but it had, uh, say, 20 trillion of them instead of uh, six or seven Four. billion. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, thirdly and finally, there is the notion of a quality superintelligence. So something that is not just more numerous or faster, but has kind of qualitatively cleverer algorithms. I think that's also possible, although it's harder to rigorously pinpoint exactly yeah. how that would work. Yeah, it's hard to imagine it because if we could, we could get going in that direction, obviously. Now, yeah, well, maybe by analogy, so we can maybe think of non-human animals as having inferior quality intelligence to us. I inferior in the sense, not that they don't work perfectly for what the animals are trying to do, like each animal's intelligence might be very well suited to its ecological niche, but certainly inferior in terms of being able to do, say, science and engineering and technology. It's just not very useful to have a dog trying to work on those problems. And if you sped up the dog, it, you still probably wouldn't get much progress on an engineering problem, nor if you made more copies of the dog. So there mm -hmm. seems to be something about the human mind that enables us to form abstract concepts more readily, and, and that gives us kind of a decisive edge in, in some of these uh, uh, areas. So similarly, maybe that could be a superintelligence that even if it didn't have more computational resources, then a particular human mind could nevertheless more quickly um, jump to the right conclusions and conceptualize things in different ways. So talk about the two ways that, that we might get to such a world. Um that you discuss in your book? Well, I think in principle, there are more than two ways. One can, uh, in principle, get to at least a weak form of superintelligence just by enhancing biological human cognition. Um, um, I think that initially might happen through genetic selection and genetic engineering. Ultimately, of course, there are limits to the amount of information processing that could take place in a biological brain. Um, we are limited to working with biological neurons, which are slow. Um, the brain can only be so big because the skull is fairly small, whereas like a supercomputer can be the size of a warehouse or larger. So the ultimate potential for information processing in machine substrate is just vastly greater than in biology. Um, and um, so most of the book concentrates, therefore, on the prospect of machine superintelligence. Although it is important, I think, and maybe we'll get to that later when one is considering the strategic uh, challenges posed by this machine intelligence prospect to think also about whether perhaps efforts to enhance biological cognition might be a good way to improve our chances of managing this transition to the machine intelligence era. But if we then think more specifically about paths to machine intelligence, one can distinguish between different types of approaches, ones that would try to achieve a general intelligence by reverse engineering the human brain. We have an existence proof of a system that generates general intelligence, the human brain. And, and one way to proceed would be by studying how the human brain does this. And then maybe use similar uh, data structures and algorithms uh, in machine substrate. Uh, the, the limiting uh, variation of that would be uh, why you would literally try to copy biology through uh, a process uh, known as whole brain emulation. Uh, but at the other end of the extreme, you have these purely synthetic approaches where you, you, you pay no heed to how biology achieves intelligence. You just try to do some basic maths and theoretical computer science and, and come up with algorithms that maybe don't look very much like what goes on in uh, uh, our brains. The analogy uh, used in the book I found helpful is the is flight, heavier than air flight. So we we can fly, humans can fly, but we don't fly like birds. Yeah, and... Uh, so I think that it's an open question which of these uh, paths will lead to machine intelligence first. Um, ultimately, whichever way you get there, I think uh, the uh, synthetic form of artificial intelligence has, has just more ultimate potential. There is no reason to think that uh, the computational structures that evolution has produced in our brains are, are close to optimal. There is probably some different way of organizing the computation um, if one has these uh, machine elements to work with, that, that, that would be more efficient. So you suggest it's only a matter of time, maybe a long time, before we get to this 
markedly greater intelligence, say, uh, let's let's stick with the machine kind. Uh, and you suggest it's going to be dangerous uh, and it poses a, a serious threat potentially to uh, to humanity. Now, you do talk about economics in the book. Uh, it's a few pages and we will get to that, I think. But you're really talking about a threat that's much different than the standard worry that, say, these machines will do everything that humans can do and therefore wages will be low and the only people who will have prosperity will be people who own the machines or can program the machines. That That is an interesting question. We may get to it. But th- putting that to the side, we have a much different set of worries. What what are they? Well, so we can distinguish two general types of outcome. Uh, I focus most of the book on um, outcomes in which the first superintelligence becomes extremely powerful. Basically, the idea for thinking that that has a non-trivial probability of happening is that it, it looks like once you have a machine intelligence that reaches sort of human level or maybe somewhat above human level, you might get a very rapid feedback loop so that even if it takes a long time to get to human level machine intelligence, the step from there to super intelligence, the radically greater than human intelligence might be fairly brief. So if you have a a fast transition from human level machine intelligence to super intelligence, a transition that plays out over hours, days, or weeks, let us say, then it's likely that you will only have one super intelligence at first before any other system is even roughly comparable. And then this first super intelligence might be very powerful. It's the only super intelligence in the world. and, And for the same reasons, basically, that that humans are very powerful compared to other non-human animals here. Uh, this super intelligence, which would be radically superior to us in, in intelligence, might be very powerful compared to Homo sapiens. It could develop all kinds of new technologies very quickly and, and strategize and plan. So Replicate achieve, itself. Yeah. If, yeah, it could create Improve more itself. Of itself. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. And um, to the point where maybe uh, one can consider that would be able to shape the future according to its preferences, whatever those might be. So in this scenario, we have one, a singleton forming. Um, Everything might then depend on what the preferences of this first superintelligence are. And um, for reasons that I go into some uh, depth about in the book, um, it looks really hard to engineer a seed AI such that it will result in a superintelligence with human-friendly preferences. Maybe Develop we can a what? What would you call it? A what? A hum, human-friendly. A, uh, no, you... a, a seed AI. So that oh, is, yeah. you start with something that is less than a superintelligence, like probably less than a human, and then you, that system eventually becomes superintelligent by either improving itself or by us improving it. And so the thing you start with would be a seed a AI that then gradually becomes a mature AI. Um, and... The idea is that we might only be able to work on this seed AI once it's a full-fledged superintelligence. It could resist further attempts by us to change its values. It runs so, amok from our perspective. <laughs> that, 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 that's the general kind of concern in this, uh, in this singleton outcome. You have one extremely powerful artificial entity, and unless it shares our values, then we might discover that our values have no place in the future. Now, the different class of scenarios is where you have a multipolar outcome, where you don't just have one system that gets so far ahead of everything else that it can just lay down the law, but instead you have many systems uh, emerging in parallel, all maybe ending up super intelligent, but at no point is one so far ahead of all the others that it can just dictate the future. So in this multipolar uh, outcome, you have a very different set of concerns. Uh, not necessarily less serious concerns, but, but they, they look quite different. So there you could have uh, economic competition setting in and evolutionary dynamics operating on this population of digital minds. And, and one might worry about the, um, the fitness landscape that uh, would shape the evolution of, of these digital minds. And, and I can now, expand on that if yeah, you want. Well, but. one of the criticisms of this worry, this neg- this um, pessimistic uh, approach or, or concerned approach, is that um, oh well, we, we just we'll just program them not to do crazy things, and since we're in charge of the code, we humans we can stop this. I, I, I want to say before you answer that that um, 
and I'm going to lay my cards on the table. I'm not as worried as you are for a different set of reasons, which we're going to come to in a minute. But I do want to concede that the people that I know in the artificial intelligence community are just as worried as you are. Um, you're a philosopher. They're in the trenches. Um, and they are deeply concerned that they are creating a Frankenstein, that they're creating a technology that will essentially cut itself loose from human um, control and do its own thing. Um, that's, that is the worry, correct? Well, I think there are a lot of different worries um, that people have regarding computers and automation. And like, obviously, there are folk worrying about drones or privacy and unemployment and all of that. So, but so those are not the focus of um, my book. I'm, I'm specifically concerned with the dangers that arise only when you have a system that reaches human level intelligence or, or, or super intelligence. And so I think that although, I mean, obviously somebody should worry about these other things as well, there is a very distinctive set of issues. And so superintelligence would not just be yet another cool inventions that humans make, uh, another cool gadget, the another GPS. useful thing economically. It would be the last invention that we will ever need to make. Um, after that, further inventions would be more efficiently done by the superintelligence. And so this transition to the machine intelligence era will be a unique point in, in all of human history, maybe comparable to the rise of the human species in the first place or to the rise of, of life from uh, inanimate matter. Um, it would be of that order of magnitude. It's really a one-of-a-kind thing. Um, so, so that's the distinctive kind of risk that, that I focus on in the book. So let me raise a... Uh a thought that I, I, I'm interested if anyone else has raised this with you in, in talking about the book. I, I ha This is a, a strange thought, uh, I suspect, but I uh, want your reaction to it. Uh, the way you talk about superintelligence uh, reminds me a lot of how medieval theologians talked about God. Uh, it's unbounded. It can do anything. Uh, except maybe create a, a rock so heavy it can't move it. Uh, has anyone ever made that observation to you? And what's your reaction to that? I think you might be the first, that, at least that I can remember. Um, hmm. Well, so there are a couple of analogies and a couple of differences as well. Um, one difference is we imagine um, that... Uh, a superintelligence uh, here will be bounded by the laws of physics, um, and which can be important when we think about how it might interact with other superintelligences that might exist out there in, in the vast universe. Um, another important difference is that we would get, design this entity. So, um, if you imagine a pre-existing superintelligence that is out there and that has created the world and that has full control over the world, um, there might be a different set of options available for us humans in deciding how we relate to that. But in this case, uh, there are additional um, options on the table in that we actually have to figure out how to design it. We get to choose how to build it. Um, Up to a point, because you raised the specter of, of us losing control of it. To me... It, it it creates um, uh, inevitably. By the way, much of this is is science fiction movie material. There, there's all kinds of interesting speculations in your book. Um, some of which would make wonderful movies, and some of which maybe less so. But uh, to me, it sounds like you're trying to question. You're raising the question of whether this this power that we're going to unleash uh, might be a a power that would not care about us. It would be the equivalent of saying of putting uh, a god in charge of the universe who's not benevolent, uh, and and you're suggesting that in the creation of this this power, we should try to steer it in a uh, positive direction. Uh, yeah. So in these uh, in the first type of scenario that I mentioned, where you have a singleton forming because the first superintelligence is so powerful, then then yes, as I think a lot will depend on what that superintelligence would want. Um, and the generic failure mode there, I think, is not so much that you would get a superintelligence that's 
like hostile or evil or hates humans. It's just that it would have some goal that is indifferent to humans. The standard example being that of a paperclip maximizer. You imagine an artificial agent is only his utility function is say linear in the number of paper clips it produces over time, but it is super intelligent. It's extremely clever at figuring out how to mobilize resources to achieve this goal. And then you start to think through how would such an agent go about maximizing the number of paper clips that will be produced and you realize that uh, it would have an instrumental reason to get rid of humans in as much as maybe humans would otherwise try to shut it off. And it can predict that there will be much fewer paper clips in the future if it's no longer around to build them. So that would already create as a side effect, uh, a, an incentive for it to eliminate humans. Um, also, human bodies consist of atoms and a lot of juicy atoms that could be used to build some really nice paper clips. Um, and so again, as a side effect, it might have reasons to transform our bodies and, and the ecosphere into things that would be more optimal from the point of view of paperclip production. Presumably space uh, probe launchers that it could use to send out probes into space that could then transform the accessible parts of the universe into paperclip factories or something like that. Um, so if one starts to think through... Uh, possible goals that an artificial intelligence can have. It, it, it seems that almost all of those goals, if, if consistently and maximally realized, would lead to a, a, a world where there would be uh, uh, no human beings and indeed perhaps nothing that we humans would accord value to. And it only looks like a very small subset of all goals, a very special subset, would be ones which, if realized, would have anything that, that we would regard as having value. And so, so that, go ahead. Yeah, so the, so the big challenge in, in engineering an artificial motivation system would be to try to reach into this large space of possible goals and take out ones that would actually sufficiently match our human goals that, that, that we could somehow endorse uh, the, the pursuit of these goals by superintelligence. So I want to come back to the paperclip example in a second, but before I do, I want to raise a, an issue that you um, talk about at length in the book, which is – the seeming easy way to deal with that is, um, well, you just keep this in a box. You know, it's in a box. It's it's a mechanical, physical thing. And you don't let it, quote, get out of the box to, say, create space probes or kill people for their atoms or whatever. But you point out that may not be as straightforward as it seems. Yeah, that's correct. So the, there is this big class of hmm, uh, capability control methods. So the control method is the problem of how to ensure that a superintelligence would be safe and beneficial. Uh, and approaches to that fall into two categories. On the one hand, you could try to limit what the system is able to do. So put it in a box, disconnect the internet cable. Perhaps yeah, you would only... plug it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe put a Faraday cage around the whole thing. Maybe you would only let it um, communicate by typing text on a screen. Maybe only answer questions. You just sort of limit its ability to affect the world. Um, and the, the other class of control methods is motivation selection methods, where instead of, or in addition to trying to limit what the system can do, you would try to engineer it in such a way that it would not want to do things that were harmful to humans. So we can get back to that. But the capability control methods, I think, um, are going to be important and useful during the development stage of the uh, this this super intelligence. Like before we have actually finished this engineering the system and put in all the pieces, we might want to use this as an auxiliary method. But ultimately, I think we'll have to solve the motivation selection problem. It doesn't look possible to me that we will forever manage to keep our super intelligence bottled up um, and, and at the same time prevent anybody else from building another super intelligence. Will you um, give some interesting examples such as you know, the, the superintelligence could hack into the financial system, bribe a real flesh and blood human to do some things that, that would help it without even maybe the person's knowledge because it's so much smarter than the person, right? So th there's some really creepy and, again, great movie possibility scenarios here um, that, that, um, that you speculate about. Yeah, so if you had – you could imagine having a completely safe AI in a box if there was absolutely no way for this AI in the box to interact with the rest of the world. 
then maybe it's it not would so be useful. Safe, but it would always be completely inert, right? Yeah. You just have a box, basically. So at some point, really to get smart use, box, but yeah, <laughs> a really smart box. And you might like, depending on your your moral philosophy, you might care about what happens inside the box for its own sake. Like if you build a lot of happy people in boxes, maybe that would be a good thing in its own right. But it wouldn't have a causal effect on the rest of the world. So at some point, you have to have somebody interact with the box a human gatekeeper who would maybe ask questions and get answers back. Um, but at this point, you open up a huge uh, vulnerability because humans are, not, humans are not secure systems. So now you have a human being interacting with this super intelligence that is, uh, has super human powers of persuasion and manipulation. And we know that even humans can sort of manipulate other humans to do their biddings. So the conservative assumption here would be that a super humanly um, able persuader and manipulator would also eventually find its way to hack out of the box or talk its way out of the box. Um, that 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 would seem to be the, the the conservative assumption if we're thinking about how to engineer this uh, system so as to solve the control problem. So this let's let's take up what I consider the the biggest puzzle for the skeptic, being me, which is I don't understand where the whole idea of preferences comes from. You talk a lot in the book about preferences, motivation, the values that this entity would have. Uh, why would it have any? Um, it's a machine. Uh, machines don't have emotion. They don't have desire. They don't have, they don't have anything like the human psychology. So why would this really smart machine have preferences, values, and motivations other than what um, we, we've told it to do, and it would be stupid to tell it to do things like kill all the people. Um, why would it develop it? You, you seem to suggest it could develop its own independently of what yeah, it's... Yeah, no, no, no. So, well, so I agree that it wouldn't necessarily have anything resembling human-like emotions and, and drives and all of that. Uh, nevertheless, from a more abstract point of view, the agent framework seems to be fairly general in that... If you have an intelligent system, a very general kind of that system uh, is a system that is uh, seeking to – that has something like utility function, some criterion by which it decides which actions to take, and that it is maybe seeking to maximize the probability or the expected utility or some other quantity like why? that. Why? Where would that come from? I mean, help me out oh, here. We would, we would put it in. Why, like, why so we would we, build – Yeah, why would we do that? Well, to um, um, to achieve some predictability about what the system, uh, how the system is going to act. Um, so one advantage with this agent-like system is that there is a particular place you can look to see what it is that the system will tend to do, that there is a utility function, and you can inspect it. And, and you know that the system is en engineered in such a way as to try to uh, produce actions that, that will you know, result in a high expected utilities. You, you, if, if you have a system where there is no particular thing like a utility function, then the system is still, if it's an intelligent thing, going to produce various actions that might be very instrumentally powerful, but you're going to find it very hard to see what, what this system will actually do. Well, it's ironic. Um, so, it's ironic so you mentioned utility functions since in uh, – a recent episode with Vernon Smith, I, we talked about how the utility function approach to the theory of the consumer is somewhat limiting. Uh, it may not be the ideal way to conceptualize much of a lot of human interaction. But the the, the part that I'm that that's hard for me to understand is that let, let's talk about Deep Blue, the the computer that plays chess, and and mm -hmm. and now we we understand that computers play chess better than humans. Um. That's all it does. It doesn't, it doesn't get excited when it wins the game. It doesn't try to cheat to win the game. Uh, it doesn't express regret if it happens to make a, uh, you know, a bad move and lose a game, which has happened, right, of course, in the history of computer-human interaction. It, it would be a mistake, it would seem to me, to impute those emotional Yeah, no, no the emotions is, is a very different thing, but it has – an evaluation function. Um, so, so the way that Deep Blue or any other chess computer works is that um, it does 
something called alpha beta search where it sort of considers if I make this move, what move can the opponent make and then what move can I make in response? And, and it can sort of think um, a number of steps ahead into the game like that. Um, but then it reaches some end state and it then has to apply an evaluation function to like heuristically say how good this end state like eight moves into the future would be. So it has an evaluation function would maybe include a count of how many pieces there are. Like if some, if one color has a lot more pieces, that's a sign that it's in a strong position. Center control might be another variable, king safety. So there is this evaluation function that tries to take an arbitrary state of the board and produce a number that somehow measures how promising that state is. And this, although this is a very simple system, is a little bit like a utility function. It's a criterion that ultimately Absolutely. determines how it makes its actions. Sure. And so, so the, the claim here is that if we wanted to create a, an evaluation function for states of the world, we would find that it would be very difficult for us to do so if the world is not a chessboard, but sort of Earth or some complex system like that. We don't know how to explicitly describe in C++ or Python or any other computing program all the aspects of the world that, that would determine whether we would regard it as, as, as better or worse, as a good world or a bad world. Right, but it's uh, – so why do you – I'm confused. Why do you mention that that – shortcoming of C++. It, that's not a shortcoming of C++. That's a shortcoming of the nature of reality. That, that's why when you talked about uh, God not being limited by the laws of physics, you've got to – in many ways, I feel like superintelligence in your story is not limited really by the laws of physics in the, in the full sense. There's no def, there's yeah. no, there's no – no matter how intelligent we are, there's no way of describing what's, quote, good for the world. That's not a question that is amenable to superintelligence. Well, I mean, so, so, so human values are complex things. Yeah. The shortcoming is in our current ability to uh, describe, capture, represent human values uh, in computing language. So this is something we don't know how to do. Maybe we could create an AI today that would want to uh, maximize the number of digits of pi that it calculated. Some very simple goal like that would be maybe within our current reach to program. But we couldn't make an AI that would like maximize justice or love or artistic beauty because these are complex human concepts that, that we don't yet know how to represent. No, but it's not that we don't know how to represent them. They're not representable. I'm well, making the claim. No, I'm they making are the claim. In, in our brains. Like, I'm, making, so some I'm making the claim. No, I'm making a different claim. I'm making the claim that justice – or a good world or an aesthetic outcome is not definable across 7 billion people. It has nothing to do with the shortcomings of our brains. It has to do with the nature of the concept of justice. This to me is very analogous to the calculation problem that uh, Hayek and Mises argued about in the, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Uh, it's not a problem of computation. It's not a problem of intelligence. It's a problem of the fundamental nature of the the thing we're talking about, the complexity of it, it's not a shortcoming of our intelligence. It's the nature of no matter how smart we were, no matter how big our brains were, no matter how many computers we had available, we could not design a set of policies that would yield justice for the world because that's not a meaningful well, state. The, there is some mechanism in our individual brains or in, in the pool of brains we have together that enables us to uh, make our judgments about whether – one state of affairs is juster than another. Um, it's not like some kind of presumably a uh, little magic angel that whispers into our ears, but our brains have machinery that enables us to make represent the concept of justice and then to look at specific possible worlds and, and judge them as juster or less just. So the idea is that you would maybe need to capture the same capability uh, in, in an artificial intelligence that, that our brains have in a biological substrate to to represent these concepts uh, in terms of which our values are defined. But we don't yet have to do that like because that's beyond the current state of the art. But you and I don't agree on what would be more just, perhaps. Well, no, but precisely so how do you because deal we have that? the same concept, we are able to disagree. And? And so there's something we have in common. We both understand sufficiently 
um, what justice is, that we would be able to have a debate about it. Like if by justice you meant oranges and by justice I meant the digit pi, then we would uh, not be able to engage in a conversation about justice. So to some extent, um, with these evaluative concepts, we succeed different people in reaching a sufficiently similar internal representation that, that we're able to engage and talk about the same thing. Like sometimes we fail when people take po talk past one another in, in moral philosophy debates, but with enough clarity, we think that it's possible actually for us to think about these things. And we care about them. We both care about justice. Uh, and, and there is some sense in which we care about the same thing. No, I agree. But, the, but, but Mike, I apologize for pushing this, because I, but I think it's central to the whole question. If, if you and I have a different conception of two different states of the world as to which is superior, right? So we have two different states of the world. In one of them, uh, there's a set of outcomes related to well-being, prosperity, creativity, aesthetics – health, longevity, et cetera. And there's another state that's different. One has more of one thing and less of another. And I like one, I like state A and you think state, I think state A is a better state and you think state B is a better state. There's no way to resolve that through. Well, then we might have different values. Like we might want different things. That's what I mean. So given that yeah. we have different values, how could it possibly be the case that if we were just smarter, say, or an outside arbiter could could solve that problem because it has more intelligence, whatever that no, no. means. So the, the, the problem that we need to solve, I mean, it's not the only problem, but one of the problems we need to solve uh, is to figure out how to uh, engineer the motivation system of an AI so that it would even agree with one human. Like, even if our goal here was only to to serve your uh, own personal preferences about right. other words. Suppose okay. you were a dictator and you yeah. were building the AI. And yeah. no, right, so already there, we have a big unsolved technical problem. At the moment, if you try to do this, you would be very unlikely to do anything that was uh, matching your values. You would be more likely to end up inadvertently with a paperclip maximizer or some AI that did something very different from, from what you had in mind. Uh, because whatever you care about, whether it's pleasure or justice or, or aesthetic beauty or football, human rights <laughs> or football, yeah, all of these are very difficult to define directly in computer code. And in fact, the problem looks somewhat hopeless if one takes the direct frontal assault approach to them. Um, and instead, the, the, the best current thinking about how you go about this is, is to adopt maybe some form of indirect normativity, where rather than trying to describe a particular desired end state, a long list of all the attributes we would want the future to have, you try to um, use uh, um, the AI's own intelligence to help with the interpretation of what you had in mind. So rather than specifying an end state, you might specify a process whereby the AI could figure out what it is that you were trying to refer to. Um, so suppose, for example, that uh, you could somehow give the AI the goal uh, to do that, which you would have asked it to do if you had thought about this question <laughs> for 45,000 years. Yeah. And, and if you had known more facts and if you had been smarter yourself. So this is an empirical uh, question, like what you would actually have said to the AI under those idealized circumstances. And the idea then is that the AI can use its superior intelligence to make better estimates of what the answer to that empirical question is than maybe you could if you just tried to have a direct stab at it. Uh, and so That's in not... this way, th through indirect normativity, you might be able to outsource some of the cognitive work that would be required if you tried to just create a long list of everything you value with the exact weights that you would have to put on every feature which looks like a hopeless product, but you could outsource some of that intellectual labor to the, the AI itself, which would be better at you than at that kind of intellectual work. Well, the reason I invoked God, and, and it's, um, I have a lot of respect for religion, and, I, and that, so don't, uh, listeners out there, misunderstand what I'm saying, but a lot of what you're saying strikes me as what non-believers call magical thinking. Just so... Bear with me for a second. Can I give an example? Yeah, so bear with me. So um, let's talk about something that's a, a little taste of superintelligence, which is big data. A lot of people believe that big data is going to solve a lot of problems. And as an economist, I look at big data. Well, I'll use uh, I'll use the – I think it's uh, – I think I'm getting this right. Nassim Taleb says, you know, the bigger the data, the bigger the error. The bigger the chance for self-deception, the bigger the chance for – uh, mis misunderstanding what's really going on. And you're suggesting that, you know, 
a big enough computer, a big enough uh, data set, you, you could – just to take an example, let's take history. You, know, you could go back. We, we, we might debate about whether some major decision in history was, was a good decision, dropping the atomic bomb, the, inva- you know, the attack on Pearl Harbor. The attack on Pearl Harbor seems to have been a mistake for Japan. But that's not obvious. There's a thousand other outcomes that, of course, could have could have happened. But I don't believe that n- there's no amount of computing power that would allow no level of quote intelligence that would be able to foresee what could have happened under the, except for God. You know, God has an infinite. There's an, yeah, there's no, a, but I'm not sure that I'm, I'm making any of those claims at all. It seems I'm like you that are. The humans so. <laughs> have a certain ability to choose actions to achieve goals. A superintelligence would have a greater ability of that same kind. Not an infinite or perfect capability, but just a greater ability than, than we humans do. Just as more capable humans might have a better uh, ability than, than than less intelligent or less educated humans. And, and just as we have more capabilities, particularly in the realm of science and engineering, than, say, uh, chimpanzees have. Well, but science and engineering are really different from most of the problems we have. That's yeah, the they're challenge. also very important. Right. Oh, I'm all for that. I think we're going to continue to make progress in science and engineering. But that's not going to help us make progress in the way we interact with each other, the problems of uh, of organization and governance that make it difficult to use science and technology successfully. Those problems aren't amenable. My claim is that – just to take, a, again, a trivial example, I don't want the leader. I don't want the president in the United States or the prime minister of the UK – to be the person with the highest IQ, that that would seem to me to be a, a grievous mm-hmm. error, <laughs> and, and it would not lead to better decisions. Mm-hmm. And you're suggesting somehow that, oh, well, that's because you're only limited to the IQ of 150 or 180. No, no, no. I, mean, I mean, I think it might lead to much worse decisions, like that the future will only consist of paper clips or some similar outcome. But the reason you think that's not the same reason I think it. You think it's okay. true because the, we'll misprogram it. I think it's true because... The world's a complex place and no intelligence can solve some of the problems with the kind of certainty that we solve science and engineering problems. That's my claim. But, well, my feeling here is that you might be thinking that I'm believing something or claiming something that I don't actually believe or claim. Um, so is there a particular capability that you think that I think that the AI would have? Yeah, I'll give you a trivial – I do. Okay. I, 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 let me give you a trivial one, but then we'll maybe we'll go to a bigger one. The trivial one is let, let's talk about the chess game. Uh, is it possible? It, it seems to me that in your story, the computer could get its opponent because it wants to win. Let's let's say in the current level of chess playing computers, they just look for the best move. But let's say its utility function, as you describe it, is is to win the game. Period. And there's there's all there's no limit on what other. Uh, that's the goal. Mm-hmm. And it it then would try, of course, to get the compu- the competitor, the human competitor, to get drunk, say, mm-hmm. uh, or, or kill it, uh, and mm-hmm. to use. And you suggest that using, say, social manipulation and strategies, uh, or look, its ability to foresee the future, it could plan and execute things that we can't imagine. And my thought is, the problems with planning the future. And seducing people and social manipulation are not just computing problems. They're they're of different nature. And having been really, really smart doesn't make you a better seducer and manipulator and and uh, and planner. It, it's there's the little relationship because of the complexity of reality. Well, so I think the, whatever the case might be about that, that there are other capabilities that would be sufficient um, to give the AI great powers to affect the world. And in fact, the science and engineering superpower on its own, it seems, could be sufficient. Um, So there are all kinds of things that we think maybe humans would achieve with our science and technology. If if we were given another 20,000 years to work on things, we might then have, I don't know, cures for aging and molecular nanotechnology and robotics that can self-replicate and space colonizing probes and all manner of other science fiction like things if t- no, 20,000 years from now right they're coming yeah so it'll probably take a lot less but at least in 20,000 years if we invest a lot in science and technology we could do uh, like almost magical technology limited by the laws of physics but superior to what we currently have so an ai uh, could i propose do all of the same things except maybe develop them much faster 
if it thinks that digital timescales rather than uh, biological uh, timescales. And so with, say, advanced molecular nanotechnology, the ability to construct like self-replicating molecularly precise robotic machinery, then that already might give it sufficient power to take over the world and implement its wishes independently of its ability to predict complex social systems. There are many different paths that we humans can see, at least in outline, that if we were much faster, many more of us, or if we were more qualitatively intelligent, we could see how we could achieve great effects in the physical world. And there might be additional ones we haven't thought of. Um, and it seems that the disjunction of all of these paths is, is quite plausible. Um, and that therefore, um, it's quite possible to think that a sufficiently uh, radically super intelligent machine would be able to find a way to change reality to more closely match uh, its preference function. Um, and again, we can make some analogy to the relationship between humans and, and say, uh, other animals. So the, the, the fate of the gorillas now, although they are much stronger than we are, um, yet their fate now depends a lot less on what they do than on what we humans do. And, and that's because our brains are just actually very slightly different from theirs. Uh, and, and those small changes in, in our brain architecture have enabled us to be much more efficient at developing technologies, but also complex social organizations and plans. And that then gives us this decisive strategic uh, advantage. So let's talk about uh, the control issue. You have a very interesting analogy to um, the development of nuclear weapons. because You talk about the singleton. Uh, you mentioned earlier the possibility that that this superintelligence might become real before in one place, one geographical place, uh, before there's competitors. And you make an analogy with the the U United States uh, being the first and only, at least for a while, a nuclear power. And you talked about the different ways that nuclear weapons might have been controlled. And uh, talk about that is very interesting and what the implications might be for uh, the superintelligence case. Well, yes, a part of that discussion was uh, to try to get some grip on the likelihood that there will be this singleton superintelligence, a system with a decisive strategic advantage, so far ahead of everything else that it can shape the future according to its preferences. Um, and so one, one variable uh, in trying to answer that question that one would want to uh, know about is how long will it take to go from something less than human to something radically super intelligent? But another variable is how long is the typical gap between different products that are striving to develop the same technology? So there have been various tech races in the 20th century, the race to develop nuclear bombs, thermonuclear bombs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, some other things like that. And, and one can see what the typical gap between the leader and the closest follower were. And, Unsurprisingly, um, it looks like it's typically between like a few months to a few years. So what conclusion one can draw from that is that if we have a fast takeoff scenario in which you go from below human to radically super uh, human levels of intelligence in a very short period of time, like days or weeks, then it's likely that there will only be one product that has a radical super intelligence at first, because it's just unlikely that there will be two running so closely neck to neck that they would undergo such a transition in parallel. Whereas if the transition from human level um, machine intelligence to super intelligence will take decades, uh, then, then we're more likely to end up with a multipolar outcome. Um, and yeah, and then, then there's the question of what we can do to try to um, coordinate our actions to avoid it. So one, one danger here is that if there is a technology race to develop the first uh, system that um, if you have a winner-take-all scenario, that each competitor will scale back on its investment in safety in order to win the race, and you'd have a kind of race to the bottom in terms of safety precautions. If 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 each um, if each investment in safety comes at the expense of just making faster progress on the in, actually making the system intelligent, and so you'd want, if possible, to avoid that kind of tech race uh, situation. And but in the aftermath of World War Two. Um there were some interesting models, which I had not been aware of, for, for dealing with nuclear power, the nuclear weapons. Yeah, so there was the, the Baruch plan uh, put forward by some 
quite senior people in the United States, and the hope would be that um, you could maybe persuade um, the Soviet Union and other key nations to put uh, atomic energy under international control. So only a new agency, a subsidiary of the UN, would have access to uh, nuclear bombs. And and this this was a a fairly serious proposal that that was you know, actually floated and and with quite high level backing. Um, in in the end, it didn't work, um, partly because uh, like uh, Stalin didn't really trust the Western powers. Uh, he saw that uh, the Soviet Union could be outvoted in the, uh, the UN Security Council, the General Assembly, and uh, there was kind of enough mistrust on both sides uh, to, to thwart it. And, and so we didn't go down that path of history. But um, it, it, one, one can debate exactly how remote the counterfactual is, but at least it was within the, sort of the, the space of conceivability yeah. at the point. But it does remind us that, that uh, it's, it's, if we could develop superintelligence sooner than later, you might care about where it originates, which is a really interesting point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there is this common technical problem that anybody would face to try to develop it, which uh, uh, is more important than exactly who develops it uh, in terms of whether the the values actually um, contain anything, um, whether the outcome contains anything that's humanly valuable. But, But it is true that in addition to that, if you could solve that technical problem, then there is still the question of which values to embed in the which values to serve with the, the the AI, and so I think that um, it is important to try to get into the field from the very beginning. This thing that I call the common goods principle, which is that superintelligence should be developed, if at all, only for the benefit of all of humanity and in the service of widely shared ethical ideals. Um, it everybody would share the risks if somebody developed superintelligence, and uh, everybody also, in my view, should uh, stand to. Uh, get a share of the benefits if things go well. Right, and that's always a challenge, of course, to um, make that happen. Yeah, I mean, on the plus side, um, the amount of resources that are to be gained, like if things really go well, we get this friendly superintelligence, can then colonize the universe, transform it into value structures, that there's just so much there, the pie is so enormously large that it would be easy to give each person like a whole galaxy to use for their own benefit. And and there would still be a lot of galaxies left over for whatever your like pet product were. Yeah. Uh, See, I want the galaxy. I want the galaxy. uh, Why not? Like, I mean, it's easy to be generous. It seems uh, when, when, when you have such an enormous cake suddenly appearing, um, that, that rather than sort of squabbling over the exact way in which we should partition it, it, we should, Instead, focus on working together to make sure that you actually get this giant cake, um, rather than up up with with nothing. But as you would, tip. but as you would point out, one of the fun things I like in your book is the th- various thought experiments. If we think about how much cake we have now compared to say twenty five thousand years ago, you'd think it would be easy to split up. It's not. We don't. We're not so good at splitting up. It's not our strong suit as human beings. Well, I mean that that's kind of. True also, although, I mean, I'm not sure how relevant it is, but I mean, there's like the sort of tinker argument of the decline of violence and uh, yeah. we have at least succeeded in splitting it up so that on average now people are, are much better off. Uh, Agreed. It's it, true. We, we could have ended up with a split where just one person had everything and everybody else had nothing, but we've succeeded in solving the splitting problem better than that. That's true. And so it's not that we are perfect by any means, but we're also like a lot better than uh, like zero in solving that. Uh, I'm not sure how much like evidence these historical parallels really bring anyway to this very distinctive kind of splitting yeah. problem. But but uh, but uh, in, in general, I think that, and not just for solving the the problem of existential risks from AI, but other really big existential risks as well arising from other possible technologies in this century. That if we could find ways to to solve some of our global coordination problems, like be better at avoiding wars and arms races and stuff like that. That would be helpful for a wide range of different uh, problems that that humanity faces. I'm not sure we're getting any better at that. That's the problem. Um, and it comes back to earlier discussion. I'm not sure technology is a decisive. I don't see it as a decisive way to solve that that global governance issue. 
that well I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that either so we might agree although i would i guess think that there has been some progress on the problem uh, it's an open question whether that will continue but but if, if i look at say this the scale of political integration back in the stone age it was like the tribe was the largest unit maybe True. 60 people or something so now now we have like over a billion people in china or we have like things like the european union large areas and we also have weak forms of global governance structures uh, international trade laws, laws of the seas, and other conventions that are much less than an actual government, but still like more than a zero. Yeah, so that's true. It might be that we've already gone most of the way towards unifying the world, and, and we just have sort of one more order of magnitude to go. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, one of the more um, interesting analogies you make in the book is uh, comparing humans to horses, which I found uh utterly delightful as a way to imagine what the world might be like in a future of with superintelligence. So let's talk about that. Um, what hap- Talk about what happened to the, ho- the role of technology uh, in affecting the horse, uh, the life of horses, their population. Yeah, so this is most relevant for the multipolar outcome. I think we end up with a kind of economic uh, competitive scenario with many different AIs and stuff. Yeah, so what happened with the horses is that there used to be a lot of them. Um, and they, they grew more numerous, but uh, at some point people developed tractors and cars, uh, and then there was a lot less demand for horse labor. So the horse population shrank from maybe 20 million or so in the U.S. down to a tenth of that um, because the horse couldn't really earn a subsistence wage anymore. Uh, so the fewer horses were made, and, and a lot of them went to the meat packers and became glue. And, and more recently, it has been some recovery because of greater demand for horses for recreational purposes, but uh, nowhere near back to their all-time high. So similarly, um, uh, I mean, so for most of human history, it looks like we've been in a kind of semi-Malthusian state uh, where average income equaled um, subsistence level with, with fluctuations. Like if there was, there was a war or a plague that wiped out a lot of people, and for a while after they could earn above subsistence level wages uh, while each, each person had more land than they needed, but then population would grow and average income would fall. And so the modern condition that we seem to think of as being very normal and that we take for granted is only a few hundred years old and a huge anomaly. Correct. Um, and But so similarly with... Um, and and that, that could obviously disappear even aside from any radical technology if we just imagine, uh, say, biological evolution acting on, on uh, the current human population, so groups that have higher fertility will dominate the far future. Uh, but it could happen a lot faster um, with digital minds, because digital minds can reproduce in in a minute rather than in 20 years. Like you can make a copy of a digital mind is software. So um, if you have another piece of hardware, you can make a copy instantaneously. Um, so the population of these digital mind workers could very quickly grow to the point where they're um, wages equals the cost of making another copy, the electricity bill, the hardware rental cost. Um, and so in, in one class of scenarios, you quickly get into a Malthusian state where the average income drops to subsistence level, but subsistence level for these digital minds, which would be lower than subsistence level for biological minds like ours, because we need, we need housing and food and stuff like that. So these would be more efficient minds that would so, so that means that no human could then uh, survive by uh, selling its wage labor in the simplest version of the model, and we would have to live off of capital. And we would be in a situation like the horses there, maybe, that uh, the, uh, the the average income we could earn would be less than subsistence, our population would diminish. Now, um, there, there are a number of wrinkles to that story that if, if, the, if, if other humans own capital and if they have a basic preference for certain products to be made by human rather than made by machine, then it might be possible for some humans to earn a wage income by producing these goods in this particular way. Just as some people now pay a premium for something to be handmade or, or made by indigenous people. Sure. Like in my, so, so similarly, if there were these very rich capitalists who owned a lot of like machine hardware in the future, um, whose growth exploded, maybe they could afford to pay a lot of humans to do these things that they prefer to have humans do. But that would, yeah. Um, so... Nevertheless, one worries about the long-term um, uh, evolutionary dynamics in that population of, of digital minds uh, and how long 
a small minority of biological human minds, slow thinking, increasingly outclassed by these ever-improving digital minds, there are trillions of them, how, how long we could sort of retain a, a property rights system that where we would control a significant fraction of the wealth, presumably, or it seems fairly plausible that maybe they would be able to figure out a way to expropriate us or changing, manipulating the political system or something like that. So, well, yeah. they could hack into the voting system and get their candidates to well, win if, every if, time. If they, could, <laughs> if they could coordinate like that. I mean, yeah. so it, it's not clear that they would, but that, that would be one concern. Also, just what happens within this population of digital minds in itself is a great source of more. So if, if there are... If the fraction of overall sentient minds that are biological is very small, then what matters most might be how, how, how things go for these digital minds. If there are trillions and trillions of those and just billions of us, then from a moral point of view, it might be much more important how they fare. And if they are earning subsistence level incomes and if they are being selected uh, constantly for increasing productivity, for spending none of their time just having fun and relaxing, uh, then we might have a dystopia where... Uh, there might be a few human capitalists and uh, rentiers, but but the vast majority of all sentient minds might be living miserable lives. And, uh, and you still face at that point the possibility of a second transition then to a, a, a synthetic AI era, like something more advanced than these human-like minds. That and and so so yeah. So th these are some of the issues that one would uh, worry about or think about in the multipolar outcome. So before we were talking mainly about the singleton outcomes where one AI gets so far ahead that it just decides what the future should be like. But even if we have this gradual transition with many competing uh, AIs, we still have these potentially quite disturbing um, prospects. I want to read a quote. Uh, part of what you're talking about is, is um, Thomas Piketty's vision run totally amok, but it, you actually say something that, that's relevant uh, to Piketty, which came up in our conversation when he was on Econ Talk. You say – a scenario in which the fraction of the economy that is owned by machines asymptotically approaches 100% is not necessarily one in which the size of the human slice declines. If the economy grows at a sufficient clip, then even a relatively diminishing fraction of it may still be increasing in its absolute size, which um, is some con consolation and, of course, is a possibility. We would get a smaller share, humans would get a smaller share, but the absolute uh, amount could be growing, and certainly the per capita amount could be growing. Yeah, I don't. But I just, just one caveat, which I do, which I don't understand. Then we'll close. Um, again, why would I put any um, welfare, any weight uh, for justice, moral weight on the well-being of machines? W what does that possibly mean when you say these digital minds might be miserable? You're presuming they have some kind of consciousness. Yeah, in this particular place, in the overall argument, I do. So uh, most of the book is independent of the question of whether machines would be conscious or not. Because the instrumental effect on the world could be the same. Correct. W whether there's inner experience or not, it's what the machines do that matters. But insofar as we are concerned with evaluating morally the desirability of these different scenarios, then uh, a lot might change on whether these machines have experience. So particularly in this scenario that you just described, where there are more and more machines that own more and more of the economy and almost all the resources is devoted to building these machines, then it seems to me that from many ethical point of views, it might matter greatly whether they have inner experiences and if so, what the quality of those are. So if they are, if they are conscious and if they are miserable, then that would seem to be a very bad thing. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, but, but that's, there are only a few places where, where that question becomes important for the argument in the book. Oh, I agree. So let's close with the following question, um, which you touch on at different places in the book, which is much of what gives life its zest is, um, is of course, not material well-being. Uh, it's not just about how many goods I have. It's about a thousand things of interacting with other people, listening to a symphony, savoring that poem uh, that we talked, we started with. And you know, telling me that that I have a galaxy is not very exciting to me, um, <laughs> right? It's true. In that galaxy, I could have the Boston Red Sox win the World Series every year or, or the Tottenham Hotspurs win the Premier League. Um, but I don't want to live on a galaxy. I don't want to have a galaxy. I want to I be with my family and my friends now. So, and, and I want 
there's something about this physical world that, that we humans are very attached to, right? We could also imagine when you're going to giving us a galaxy, it could be a, a digital galaxy. But we like we like the sentient yeah. tactile world. Close us out with some thoughts on where you think, given the potential for technology, no matter how – we don't know the limits, but, they're, but we haven't reached them. That we do know. Uh, they're going to be the world's going to be very different in 25 years and maybe in 100 years. So different, it's unrecognizable. What are the prospects that it'll be a world that we will want to live in, or will our children be so different that they they won't see it the way we do? Yes. Let, let me first say that that point that you're making kind of strengthens the point that I was trying to make earlier, which is that there would really be no need to squabble over the exact division because human. Value goals are mostly resource satiable. That you don't really need even a galaxy. Yeah. I mean, you don't even you need, need a, a whole planet. <laughs> like you just need a house, right? Yeah. Uh, um, so that 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 makes it even more obvious that there is way more resources there than than would be needed to give everybody like ninety nine point nine percent of what what they feel that they need. Um, but um, let me say something um, on top of that, though, which is that um, so we've been discussing mostly like what could go wrong and the risks and dangers and stuff. I mean, I also think that there is this enormous upside, though, uh, if we got super intelligence right. Um, one is kind of negative in that it could help us avoid other existential risks. Mm. Uh, but but also, uh, more interestingly, perhaps, you know, so I, I have like um, some background from, uh, like I come from a transhumanist perspective. So I just think that um, human nature, human biology places big constraints on the kinds of values that we can realize, that we die, we rot away and die after just a few paltry decades. Like even trees have longer lives than human beings. Uh, and we're limited to thinking with these three-pound cheesy lumps of gray matter inside our skulls. Presumably there are thoughts and, and feelings and wonderful experiences that just don't fit into these three pounds that, that we used to, to feel and experience with. Um, and that there is probably a very large space of possible modes of being, ways of relating, feeling, thinking, wanting, that, that are totally inaccessible to us because of our current biological limitations. But that if we manage to overcome them and if things go well and if we use these new capabilities wisely, then I think the future could be wonderful literally beyond our ability to imagine. Uh, we, we have no inkling of what like a planet-sized mind, billions of years old, that is able to re-engineer its own internal processes for maximum enjoyment and appreciation of beauty and spirituality, what it would be like to be such a thing. But um, I think it might be kind of naive of us to think that we have already hit the ceiling and that all the things that we can value are kind of the end of what's actually valuable. My guest today has been Nick Bostrom. He's the author of Superintelligence. Nick, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Yeah, I enjoyed it. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>